Will you please join me in this morning's call to worship? We gather this morning to find joy and comfort in one another. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. It is good to be together again. Whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary remotely via Zoom or listening to this later as a recording, it is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection opportunity, greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project the image of the people who are on Zoom and ask them to turn on their cameras and give us a wave. And now I'd ask all of you to turn toward the back where the camera is and return that wave. Wherever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are Birmingham Unitarian Church and we are building a beloved community. As we light our chalice this morning, I share the words of Sergeant Major Bill Paxton. May we never forget our fallen comrades. Freedom isn't free. Today, may our light shine brightly for all those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Now, if you would please stand as you are able, in body or spirit, and we'll sing hymn number 1008 in the Teal Hymnal, When Our Heart Is In a Holy Place.
Memorial Day is a remembrance of our nation's military dead. For many, this is also a time to remember loved ones who have gone before. Today's service will focus mostly on those who have died in the service of our nation, but we begin with a time for all ages that explores the concept of death as a natural part of life. After this, everybody will stay in the sanctuary, but if you're like under 10 and you get bored, there are busy bags outside. Everybody else has to suck it up, but if you're <laughs> under 10. Uh, this is used with permission from our previous director of religious education, Nico Van Ostrand. This morning's story is based on a book called The Fall of Freddie the Leaf by Leo Buscaglia. Spring came. Freddie, the leaf, was born on a branch of a tall tree along with hundreds of other leaves. Together they danced in the breeze and played in the sun. Daniel was the largest leaf and Freddie's best friend. He explained to Freddie that they were part of a tree in a park and about birds and the sun and the moon. Freddie loved being a leaf. In summer, many people came to the park. Let's all give them some shade, said Daniel. Making people happy is part of our purpose in life. Summer passed and fall came. The leaves turned red and yellow. They were all very beautiful. One day, some of the leaves were blown off by a strong, cold wind. The leaves became frightened. What's happening, they said. It's the time for leaves to change their home, Daniel said. Some people call it dying. Will we die, Freddie asked. Yes, Daniel answered. Everything dies. I won't die, said Freddie. But his friends started to fall one after another. Soon, the tree was almost bare. I'm afraid of dying, Freddie told Daniel. We are all afraid of things we don't know, Daniel said. But you were not afraid when spring became summer or when summer became fall. Changes are natural. Will we return in spring, Freddie asked. I don't know, but life will. Life lasts forever, and we are part of it, answered Daniel. We only fall and die. Why are we here? Freddie asked again. Daniel said, for the friends, the sun and the shade. Remember the breeze and the people and the colors in fall. Isn't that enough? That afternoon, Daniel fell with a smile. Freddie was the only leaf left. The first snow fell the next morning. The wind came and took Freddie from his branch. As he fell, he remembered Daniel's last words, life lasts forever. Freddie landed on the soft snow closed his eyes and went to sleep. In the tree and in the ground, there were already plans for new leaves in spring. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas. 
environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Our plate sharing recipient for May is Michigan Liberation, or Michigan Black Mama's Amazing Bailout Project. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward. now invite the ushers to come forward. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of Michigan Liberation and our congregation, and dedicate ourselves to its service. Thank you. We come now to the time in the service that we set aside for spiritual practices, centering in prayer. We begin usually with the sharing of joys and sorrows. We haven't had any submitted today, so just as a reminder, you can submit those online through the website. There's also a book in the back where you can write them. And we know that even if some had been submitted, there would always be those that remain on our hearts, too close to share. As we begin our acknowledgement of Memorial Day, a few words. Like all holidays, the meaning of Memorial Day has changed and grown over time. There are varying interpretations. It began after the Civil War and the main practice of the holiday at that time was decorating graves of soldiers who had died during that war. After the First World War, the scope of the remembrance was extended to all military dead of America. It is hard to find exact information about our nation's military personnel and their actions for reasons of national security. Today we have slides that display the names of fallen military personnel from the past year, but it should be noted that no such list is ever complete. 
and we honor these and all military personnel who have given their lives in the service to our nation. And we long for a day when military action is a distant memory. Alongside them, we honor our own beloved dead as well. It is our congregation's practice to light candles on the fourth Sunday of the month to honor those who have died this month or anyone who's on your mind. I invite you to come forward, moving down this aisle. You will light a candle and then return down this way. As a reminder, please place your lit candle at the back of the basin. And we start with the candle lit to honor the beloved dead of those who are joining us on Zoom and those who are not able or comfortable to move forward.
Memorial Day is a federal holiday in the United States for honoring and mourning the U.S. military personnel who died while serving in the United States Armed Forces. It is observed on the last Monday of May. From 1868 to 1970, it was observed on May 30th. This observance has taken place for 155 years. My spouse served, his brother served, and my two siblings served. My sibs both receive regular payments because of their exposure to Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. My older sib served in the US Navy on a carrier off the coast of Nam. My youngest sib served in the United States Air Force in Thailand. It was a difficult time. I carried a sign during a march in the small city where we lived which said, get out of Nam. I worried my parents would find out and disown me. I finally understood the Civil War issue of one son fighting for the North and the other fighting for the South. It was a hard lesson to learn. Some of you know the story of how my spouse departed from the service with his honorable discharge in the 1960s and how we met in college. Some of you know of that fateful day when I sensed something was wrong and he finally said to me, every one of my best buds were all shipped out together. They and their shiny white boat were plopped down in the middle of the Mekong Delta. And within three days, the boat and all hands on board were blown to smithereens. I remember Robert looking at me squarely, and I could see the pain in his eyes. When constructed, he visited the Vietnam Memorial and said goodbye to all his best buds. James Garfield, way back on May 30, 1868, at Arlington National Cemetery said, we do not know one promise these men made, one pledge they gave, one word they spoke, but we do know they summed up and perfected by one supreme act, the highest virtues of men and citizens. For love of country, they accepted death and thus resolved all doubts and made immortal their patriotism and their virtue. This morning's reading is an excerpt from Litany for All Souls by Lucian Price. This was written after his time serving in the First World War. Death in our time has changed its face. Never before has life meant so little or death so much. For most of those lives which war is reaping are the wrong ones, young men forced to die for a way of life which they have not had time to enjoy. We are losing our best. The only spirit which is worthy of their broken bodies, of their shattered minds, their blasted hopes, the thwarted talents, is the prevention of this frightful and recurrent scourge, the plague of the firstborn. Who dare say that we who live are worthy of those who have died? Who dare say that our society is yet worthy of such human sacrifices? 
on us who survive is laid the solemn accountability to build a world order that can live guiltless of innocent blood. Every year on Memorial Day, I like to look up some facts about people who serve in the military um, because it feels like an abstraction, right? So who, who are we actually talking about here? It is estimated that there are about 1.4 million people currently serving in our nation's armed forces. Now, for reasons of national security, there are no exact numbers. And also, there is no list of where people are stationed but it is estimated that the majority of U.S. active duty personnel are stationed domestically, at least according to what I could find. And we also have people stationed in every region of the world. Those numbers don't include military contractors who do a lot of the work for the military. 
Of the people who are currently enlisted in the U.S. military, an estimated 592,700, no, 592,979 are under the age of 25. So that's about 43%. An additional uh, 287,604 service members are between the ages of 26 and 30, which brings the number of U.S. military service members that are age 30 and under to just over 58% of the military. That's 817,583. It's also difficult to get a precise list of military deaths, again, for national security and privacy, so I have to credit Reverend Rachel Lonberg of People's Church in Kalamazoo for compiling this year's list. There were at least 28 active duty military personnel who died this past year. The oldest one of them was 41. I think it should be noted that the majority of the military deaths this year were due to accident or suicide. Our military is made up mostly of young people, and what we ask them to do is dangerous, and it is difficult, and it takes a toll on them. The purpose of Memorial Day is to honor those who have lost their lives in military service. And that brings up complicated feelings for many Americans and many Unitarian Universalists. It is right and fitting for us to pay respect to the people who have died while serving in our nation's military. All people have inherent worth and dignity, and the people who put themselves in danger for the sake of our nation deserve support and acknowledgement. It's the what constitutes for the sake of our nation that causes disagreements, especially in union churches. Many of us are critical of the military industrial complex. The military personnel and the military industrial complex are two different things, and we would do well to tease them apart. To spend this day only on discussing what we think is wrong with our military does not do justice to what this day is for. This is the holiday when we honor those who have died. We have practically every other day of the year to talk about the American military as a construct. Today is for honoring these young people. For many of us, thinking about this year's military dead brings to mind the veterans that we have loved and especially those we have lost. The veteran that I have known best and lost is my father, William Harrison Heilman, called Bill. He was from Indiana, so his name is William Harrison Heilman. My dad died in 2016, and although he did not technically die in the service of our country, he very much did die in the service of our country. My father was one of the first attack helicopter pilots and after serving two tours of duty in Vietnam, years and years, decades later, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And a few years after that, he participated in a VA study that determined conclusively he had no genetic predisposition for Parkinson's disease. It seems pretty clear that my father's neurological deterioration was in fact linked to his service in Vietnam, perhaps elsewhere. I think it's fair to say that although he didn't die in the line of duty, my father did give his life for the service of this nation. He grew up in Knox, Indiana, which is near Kokomo in Peru, for those of you who know things about where cars are made. He went a little adrift in his early college years, as people do. It was the 60s, and he did not know what to do with the shifting world. It was confusing. And when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he felt unmoored. I honestly am not sure how he felt about Kennedy, but the assassination of an American president shook him. And he decided to leave school and join the military. He used to tell a story about those early days of his service. After he finished basic training, he decided he wanted to go to jump school and 
what 22-year-old guy doesn't want to go learn how to jump out of planes? Of course, he wanted to go <laughs> to jump school. So he was sitting in an airport on his way to do that, and he says that he saw a newspaper headline that read, ships attacked in Gulf of Tonkin. And he said he had two thoughts at the same time. Where is Tonkin and something that I won't say in the pulpit? My dad went on to become one of the first attack helicopter pilots and also a decorated war veteran. He and his cohort advanced quickly through the ranks because there was no one else who was doing what they were doing. So he was a chief warrant officer level two by the time he was 30. He was a hero who flew into a typhoon to deliver supplies to desperate soldiers. He was a brilliant man who used math and triangulated radio signals to find his way back from a night mission after he lost all of his instrument panels. And he was haunted by those years in Vietnam. He suffered severe night terrors for the rest of his life. Those years molded and scarred him. My dad eventually completed his education. He began his career in aerospace engineering with a touch of astrophysics in the late 1970s. When my parents met, he was working on positioning satellites over the Earth to beam down maps, which later became GPS. Eventually, he found his way to NASA's shuttle program where he was a ground navigator, served several missions, but he stayed on as a National Guard reservist. And I have vivid memories of him polishing his boots before going away for one week and a month and two weeks every year. And also buzzing the backyard in a helicopter from time to time. <laughs> but that was the kind of dad he was. <laughs> one of the things that he used to talk a lot about was teaching Saddam Hussein's military how to fly attack helicopters in Iran. Saddam Hussein seemed like a good ally for the United States at the time which changed pretty quickly. And my dad used to lift that up like a parable. You never know how things are going to turn out. During the Gulf War, I was a teenager who thought she knew something about politics. And I used to ask him if he felt bad about having worked with our enemy. And he would say, no, my mission was to follow orders. And so that's what I did. But dad, I would say, now other guys are having to fight him and you helped him, which I regret. But when you're 13 and you think you know something about politics, you say things like that. And my dad would say something like how the military is actually not responsible for predicting the future. And soldiers are only responsible for following their orders. My dad had an interest in theology, and I can hear St. Augustine's Just Wars theory in there. I've often wondered if my dad and I met as just two random adults, if we would be friends. And I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Had, had we met in the 60s, I think I would have been on the opposite side of the picket line. My dad never had a lot of charitable things to say about war protesters. But who knows? Who knows what I would have thought and felt at the time? And if my dad and I met in my young adulthood in the early 2000s, what would that have been like? I know what I was like during that time. I stormed an army recruiting office with code pink to protest the Iraq war. What would my dad have been like? Would he have had the same, the same stubbornness, the same conservative beliefs? Would he have been working in that army recruiting office with me standing on a desk chanting something? Most likely, there is no reality in which we could have been friends. But I also think that there is not a world in which I could be me without having been his daughter. And there is not a world where he could have been who he was without the military. Some of the essential parts of him, his personality, were influenced by the military and they have been translated down to me and they inform who I am as a human and also as your minister. For example, not being able to predict the future, like Saddam Hussein's helicopters, is very much at the core of who I am. We have to release the outcome of our decisions because we never have the benefit of historical perspective. Being bunched up with anxiety doesn't make anything better. We can only make 
the best decision that we can with the information that we have at the time, and then we have to be gentle with ourselves if it goes sideways. Another thing that the military gave my dad that was then passed down to me and impacts our life here together at BUC is a combination of integrity, creativity, and tenacity that is often called gumption. It's a strong military value, gumption. I come from a get it done background, and I realize now that that is from my dad's military service. And I think it is especially about having been in that first group of young men learning how to how to have an attack helicopter. What does that mean? They were forging the path as they went. As rigid and structured as the military can be, those young men got a lot of leeway for emergent situations. They had to solve unexpected and novel problems. But they had to do it with a set of ethical standards on a budget and on time. I have the benefit of uh, my dad wrote a book. He wrote a memoir before he died. So I have all of these stories of them trying to figure out how to get this massive amount of water to that one really specific place and then getting attacked along the way. And should we stop and pick those guys up that are stranded? And how they had to figure out how to make all of those decisions. For them, the solution was almost always related to physics. Lucky for you, I rarely have to use physics in my job. <laughs> But ethics, budgets, and timeliness are very much at the top of my list. If we are in a rapidly changing environment and we can't get where we need to go because there is no road there, well, we're just going to have to build a road, right? The last piece of military culture that filtered down to me and informs my understanding of Unitarian Universalism is institutional loyalty. My dad was a staunch, hard-nosed Republican, like all caps, Republican. That man loved Ronald Reagan. He wanted to name the dog Dutch. My mom would not allow that. <laughs> he also loved the Bushes to varying degrees. <laughs> but he served our nation just as loyally under Democratic presidents as he did Republicans. Administrations come and go, but the work remains the same. My dad had a dirty joke about Bill Clinton for every day of the year, but he did what he was supposed to do when Bill Clinton was the commander in chief. Duty, honor, courage, sacrifice, those values don't change regardless of who has the top office. The dependency that you have on your fellow soldier and that they have on you, that does not change. And I realize now how much this informs my understanding of ministry and of Unitarian Universalism. Systems come and systems go, but the covenants that we make to each other in the heart of Unitarian Universalism, that stays the same. We just keep showing up for each other. Doesn't matter what happens. One of the most vivid memories that I have of my dad in his later years was at a baseball game about five years before he died. When they played the national anthem, I watched him gather all of his strength to stand up from his wheelchair and salute. It's hard to describe the amount of effort and determination that it took for him to do that. But watching him in that moment, that pride that he felt about his service was, was palpable, and I've always never understood why he wasn't angry at the military. But when I saw that, I realized that his service made him believe that his life and that his death had meaning. He spent over 20 years with Parkinson's disease, and it gave that meaning. Who am I to diminish that with my theory-based criticisms of the military? And what I realized in that moment is that I don't actually know anything about being in the military or military service, and I won't, ever. And I don't need to. It's enough to understand that I don't understand and to have respect for that. Beloved, we here, most people, long for a day when military action is a distant memory, when it's over, when it doesn't happen anymore. We long for the day when we have created that world order that 
can live guiltless of innocent blood. We are called to work for peace. We are called to call out what is wrong. But we are also called to care for those who serve and to mourn those who have died in the service of this nation. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. Will you please join me um, in singing hymn number 101 in the gray hymnal, Abide With Me. Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so, amen, and blessed be. As a reminder, there is a service in the Memorial Glen after this.